All right, guys, welcome back to another video. So in this one, we're going to be working on my Stanley number 45. Now, this was a very lucky purchase on my part. I was able to get the original plane for about 65 bucks Canadian here uh, off of a nice gentleman on Kijiji. Now, the only problem with the plane is that the fence component that you can see on the right hand side of the table there uh, was really messed up. It had a there's a set screw in it that helps lock the fence in place and it was sheared off and I managed to destroy the original piece trying to remove it. So luckily, I was able to get that replacement from Michael Jenks for a very, very very fair price shipped up from the US. So in total, this plane cost me about 120 bucks, which is not bad given how much these things can go for. Now, a little bit of a warning at the beginning of the video here, this is not going to be a perfect restoration. As you can see, I am currently sandblasting uh, this plane to take off all the original nickel plating. Now, the reason for this is because the nickel plating was starting to chip in quite a few places, and there's no way for me to really go about cleaning that up and making it look good. The other part of this is that I just personally don't think that the original silvery color and nickel plating looks very good. I much prefer the look of a darker tool. So that's what exactly we're going to be doing to this. So I went through, sandblasted all of our components to get them down to their raw steel. And I made sure to protect the rosewood handle on the main body just with some painter's tape. With the rest of our components, there's just a little bit of rust buildup on them. So I'm going to put them in this rust removing bath, just eat away a little bit of that rust so that they are ready to go when we want to finish cleaning them up and put them on the final plane. Now this rust removing bath does work amazing. You can see that it's pretty dark because I've used it quite a few times now, but it still works like a charm. Uh, it'll eat away and remove every little bit of rust that's on any of these pieces, even pieces that just have kind of surface rust built on them. It'll eat that right away. And same thing with the deep rust, it'll eat that away. And you're left with a little bit of pot marks here and there, but that's to be expected. And so all these pieces just come out of the bath, you dry them off and they are pretty much good to go. From there, I can move on to doing some of our refinements. So I started by just trying to get all of the original lacquer varnish off of the handle. I'm not quite sure what they used on these handles. All I know is I'm not a huge fan of the feeling of it. On any of these old tools that I restore, I like to go through and get them down to their bare wood and put a nice wax finish on them. I find that this feels a lot better in the hand and it's honestly something I'm planning to do with my Veritas tools when I get around to it. I'm also going to take this opportunity to just clean up the skates. So I'm starting here with some 180 grit on a piece of MDF to just get them trued up because they weren't out of flat by any means, but just going through and starting to polish them this way just made sure that they were flat -er. Uh Then from here, I'll go up to 320, 400, and 600 grit of sandpaper to just give them a nice polished edge. Uh, because these are going to be one of the few pieces of uh, exposed bare metal in this plane in its final form, I want them to be nicely polished up and to be looking really, really good good. So with all those parts cleaned up now, we can move on to painting. So I'm going to start by just masking off our areas that we've cleaned up. The skates, you know, we want to make sure that that metal stays nice and polished. So we don't want to get any paint on it and have to go back through and repolish them because then we risk uh, stripping the paint off the areas that we just painted and just running around in circles. So the best thing here is to just protect them. Initially, we're also going to wrap that uh, rosewood handle to make sure that I don't accidentally get any overspray on it either. For the paint, we're going to be using a custom mixture that I came up with. Now, this is nothing special or proprietary. All I did was take some flat black and uh, gloss green trim clad, mix them together until I reached a color I like, and that's as simple as it is. Then I'm going to go through and airbrush it on because this puts on a nice light coat of paint. And so on all these parts, I did three coats of this paint and it came out looking really good. Now, what I love about this mixture of the flat black and gloss green is it kind of mutes each other. So if the tool was glossy and just really shiny, I don't think it would look very good. But on the flip side, if it was just you know matte black or matte green, it wouldn't look good either. So this kind of soft luster you get by mixing the two together looks great in my opinion. And it just overall gives the, it gives the plane a you know a little bit more of a professional finished look compared to like a matte finish, but is also not super shiny and obnoxious. 
And again, I really love using the airbrush to do this because it puts on a nice, thin, even coat of paint every single time. And you have just a ton of control on where you're putting the paint down. So you can make sure that you're not getting like drips or blotches, anything like that. And again, it's just the, the level of control that you have and the quality of the paint job is so much better than you can ever get with like a spray can and that. So if you're interested in doing this kind of stuff with tools, you know, just adding on this fresh coats of paint, I highly recommend looking into an airbrush. They're not super expensive. You can use your shop air compressor like I'm doing, and it just, it works so well and so much better than spray paint. Then the final step of the painting is adding in our detailing. So this is Royal Red Gloss Trim Clad. Uh, again, a super cheap and affordable paint. And all we're gonna do with it is just using a 20-0 brush, go over all of our numbering and lettering and anything like that. Any of our key details that you know make this plane special, I wanna go over them to just make them pop a little bit better. Now, I chose this color purely because it's what I had in my shop at the time, and it is the best choice I ever could have made. Because we have that greenish black base color on the tool, this red pops and just contrasts so beautifully, and all these numbers and letters stand out are really well in that final piece. Now this is not an easy thing to do and it definitely took a little bit of time and patience and having the smallest brush possible definitely helped. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it is a little bit rough in certain areas, but you can always go back in with a little bit of that green paint and just touch up areas where you have like a little bit of uh, spillover or anything like that. So this is something, you know, if you're looking to do your own tools, I highly recommend doing this. It really takes a, you know, kind of a flat, plain looking surface and adds in this, that little touch of detail. And again, obviously you don't need to use red or any, you know, anything, you don't need to make it super obnoxious. Uh, you could go a little bit more low, low profile, you know, make it a little bit more subtle, that stuff like that. But again, for me, this is, this is the style that I'm going to be doing all of my tools in from now on. Every plane that I restore, every, you know, any, any tools that I get that have details like this. I'm going to be going over them, adding in these highlights and that, and just making them all look nice and similar to each other, but also my own kind of special style. Thank you. 
And then with the rest of the components, I'm just gonna go through and burnish them with a maroon scotch bright pad. What this will do is it'll just add a nice luster. And I'm doing this on any of the components that I'm just leaving as raw metal. So these are the main support rods for the plane and they just, with that maroon pad, you end up with a, just a nice soft luster. From there, moving on to our wood components again, we're gonna clean up the knob as well as the rosewood fence here. Uh, and the idea with this fence is I just wanna get back down to that raw rosewood. I don't need it to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I just want that raw rosewood exposed so that when we apply wax in a little bit here, uh, it looks really good. Then the wax I'm using here is actually Clark's cutting board wax. Now, what's really nice about this is it's a citrus oil and wax mixture. And so what it ends up doing is it leaves your hands smelling wonderful after you use a tool. Now, obviously with this tool, you're not gonna be, you know, you're not doing too much with it with your hands, uh, but it does just work really well on these tool handles. And it's just become my favorite because it leaves your hands smelling kind of that nice citrusy smell rather than sweaty after you use a tool. And so it is a light duty wax. You are gonna need to reapply it often, but it does work quite well. And again, it feels wonderful in your hands on these nice raw wood handles. Then on to our final assembly here. So with all of our components all cleaned up and looking awesome, it's now time to put everything back together. Now, the problem that I ran into here is that I disassembled this plane in back in November and I'm only reassembling it now near the end of January. So there was a lot of different components and I kind of had to take my time figuring out which pieces go where, making sure that I was filling all the different holes in this thing, uh, which was a slight challenge. I definitely had to Google a few times where certain pieces go because this is by far the most complex tool I've ever taken apart and reassembled. But obviously everything was able to be put back together and it looked absolutely amazing. There's a, There's been a few times now where I've you know put things together that I've cleaned up, mainly that Miller Falls breast drill that you guys may have seen, uh, where I looked at it and I went, this thing looks horrible, you know, what have I done? Whereas with this tool, when I put it all together and you know as, I, as the pieces started to come together, it just looked so amazing. I am just absolutely ecstatic with how this tool came out and I could not be happier. There's not one part of this tool that I would change in any possible way. Everything on this thing just looks the exact way I wanted it to look and I always hoped it would look. So I know again, this might make the uh, the more fanatical people more, you know, a little bit upset because, you know, I took the, the nice uh, nickel plating and just blasted it off with the sandblaster and then painted it my own colors. But again, for me, this is, you know, this tool looks so awesome and is going to be completely unique to me now. And I get to have it in my shop and I'll someday pass it down to my nephew or, you know, someone. You know, if I end up having kids someday, maybe I'll pass it down to them. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just going to be a cool tool to have in my collection forever. Then with the blades, the uh, most of them are pretty badly bent. So I just went through with my little light hammer here and just a slight taps, very, very controlled, making sure to you know kind of get them closer to being flat. I just checked them against some of my cast iron surfaces. Once they were close to flat, I went through and actually flattened them on my diamond stone here. Once they were flat, I could then go through on a normal whetstone and just give them a quick sharpen up up to 8,000 grit. This got them that nice razor sharp edge and made them cut really cleanly. Now, like most hand tools, this one is gonna come with a pretty steep learning curve, probably more so than most other hand tools because you have to keep it square, you have to keep everything going nice and straight. And you know, these first few cuts I did were not the best you know, I possibly could. But again, it's a tool that I am very excited to learn how to use here. And it's really interesting, you can see here, the knickers on this plane were kind of shot and really with no, with no real good way to repair them. But all I have to do is just cut a knife line going across and that ends up leaving a good clean uh, cut with the, you know, and basically does the job of the knickers. So it just takes a little bit of extra planning and thought before you start making your cut. So it would be great if those knickers worked, but again, I'm not, uh, I didn't want to replace the, basically the entire plane for the sake of those two little knickers that are on it. Okay, 
So there we go, we got the Stanley number 45 all cleaned up, all looking great, and it cuts nice and cleanly too. So the one thing I want to make very clear about this tool is that this is not going to be a tool that you're going to constantly see in my videos. I'm not going to be using it to do all of my groove cutting in that at any, you know, in any kind of way is this going to be a day-to-day -day use tool. The main reason I wanted to get this tool and go through all this effort of cleaning it up, making it look in that, is I want it to be part of my collection. I want it to be an option that I have in my shop when I need to cut a groove. I want to have this option available. One important thing to understand about a hand tool like this is that it takes a lot of time and practice. The biggest thing right now is just trying to keep this thing square when I'm pushing it through. I'm still having some trouble with it wobbling around and cutting a groove that is just super messy in that. But again, I've only used this whatever it is six times and i'm sure with a little bit more practice i'll get better with this tool and be able to actually use it the trick is is the tool like this is only so useful and any of you hand tool users i promise i'm not trying to be rude or offensive at it right now but the trick with a tool like this is no matter how good you get with it how much time you put into sharpening the blade tuning the whole tool up it's never going to do as good as a table saw because that's what you're directly comparing it to because this only cuts through grooves which is exactly what you use a table saw for uh the table saw is always going to do a better job and, and we could argue about this forever but we all know for a fact that that spinning you know, 50 tooth blade or a dado stack is going to make a much cleaner groove than this tool really will ever be able to make. And the table saw can do it way faster than this tool can ever do. But that doesn't mean that this tool is not worthwhile or worth having in the shop and it doesn't make this tool useless. The big difference here is understanding the difference between modern power tools and hand tools. Modern power tools were designed, you know, a table saw is designed to maximize the efficiency in the shop. The way that a table saw is built, especially with the blade with those nice sharp carbide teeth, that solid fence, the solid cast iron surface, all around that machine is built to be very heavy and very precise and that's what it's that is what it's specifically designed to do and so when it comes to cutting grooves a table saw 100 percent of the time is going to be your best option but there are definitely going to be occasions where this might just be my best option you know working on some bigger boards this might be a good option as well but again even comparing this to like a router the router is still going to win out pretty much every single time in the majority of my woodworking because it's just a better option. It's always going to leave you with that good, clean, crisp groove or data, whatever you're trying to cut. Uh, whereas this one, it really depends on your skill level and how you're set up and how your tool is set up. So that's the big difference there. But the big thing with a tool like this is that it's kind of the, I don't want to say novelty because that's that, that doesn't make it sound good, uh, but it's just the experience of using it. So whereas a router or the table saw is not really fun, you know, there's not really enjoyment in using that tool. This tool has enjoyment to it. Even just cutting these grooves that I've done on this piece of pine, they're, they're not coming out good, but it is a ton of fun to just play with this tool and really figure out how to use it. And so that is my plan for this tool. And, and the same goes for any of the hand tools that are building in my collection here. The whole purpose of this is not to become a hand tool user. I don't, I, I much prefer the majority of my woodworking to be done with the machinery because it's more precise, more accurate, and all that that I could ever do with the hand tools. But what I like about the hand tools is the experience. It's fun to kind of turn the power off in the shop or well, keep the lights on that, but, but just work without having to worry about plugging a tool in, you know, worrying about spinning bits that could literally kill you in a matter of seconds. Dealing with a tool like this has a lot of enjoyment to it. And the best way I can think to compare this is modern vehicles versus horses. Back in the day, they used horses for everything and the horses were a good way to work up until vehicles came along. And vehicles are obviously clearly the better option for the majority of cases. There are certain occasions where a horse is the only thing that'll work for that situation. And for a lot of us, a horse is just a fun thing to go out and ride every once in a while. But you get my point. The idea with this tool is not to become like a daily user, to not become my primary method of cutting grooves in the woodworking. Uh, it's just meant to be a fun alternative if I want to do something different one day. And that's a very big thing in woodworking is you want to give yourself those alternatives because, you know, if you're just spending every day working at your table saw, you're, you're going to get bored of woodworking pretty fast. So I wanted to make sure I explain, you know, what I'm going to be using this tool for because it's one that you're not going to see very often in my videos. But when you do see it, you know, you guys will understand why. It's just because I wanted a break from using the power tools of that. And I just wanted to have a little bit of fun using a old school style tool. So anyway, the glory shots for this plane are coming up in just a moment here. But as always, guys, I do hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I've got a whole bunch more tools that are going to be coming out over the next few months here. I've got a few number fives, a few uh, hand drills, not that I'm going to be restoring. All this stuff is just going to be kind of coming out as it comes out. Uh, I don't really have a set schedule for anything anymore. So I hope you guys enjoy this video and I will see you in the next one.